A candy-coated crime. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. August 9, 1898, Delaware socialite Elizabeth Denning opened a box of chocolates addressed to her from a friend in San Francisco. But this box of seemingly innocuous sweets would provide much more than a decadent treat. It would open the floodgates to adultery, scandal, and what some call one of the United States' most infamous and disturbing crimes. At the helm of said crime, a notorious character that history will not soon forget. Today, we're talking about the chocolate candy murders. On February 12, 1891, John P. Dunning, a journalist that had, over the years, gone through various stages of unemployment, married Elizabeth Pennington, a friendly woman of high society who lived with her parents and sister in Delaware. For a sometimes employed journalist, Dunning had kind of hit the jackpot with Elizabeth Pennington. She was the daughter of ex-congressman and former attorney general of Delaware, John Pennington. And the Pennington's Dover house and fortune was massive and stood right up against the Dover Green, then and now precious real estate in the center of the Delaware state capital. Dunning at the time was a handsome local reporter, but made a name for himself in 1889 when he scored big as the first journalist to confirm that a typhoon had hit Samoa, destroying U.S. and German warships and killing more than 200 sailors. Only one telegraph office was running on the island of Samoa, and John knew the weight of the news. To prevent other reporters from hearing that this tragedy was happening and reporting back, Dunning sent excessive telegraphs of Bible verses through the telegraph office, endlessly busying the one line after he received the news. According to one source, this stunt to clog the telegraph line from Samoa likely cost him $8,000, over $260,000 today. That's just the kind of man John P. Dunning was. So after this, he kept working in Delaware and on the West Coast, married Elizabeth Pennington, and the two started their lives together. Two things you should know about Elizabeth. She had a well-known sweet tooth, and she tried to make things work. But marriage to Dunning went downhill quickly. John was a gambler, a cheat, and was often in debt. But Elizabeth, a traditionalist, wanted to work it out. So when John got an offer to become the head of Associated Press's Western Division Bureau, based in San Francisco... Both Elizabeth and John thought it would be a good gig, and maybe even a fresh start. After their daughter Mary was born, not even a year before their first wedding anniversary, the Dunning-Penningtons moved to 2529 California Street in San Francisco. But this much-anticipated fresh start didn't last long, because John would meet someone else, a larger-than-life woman by the name of Cordelia Bodkin. Cordelia Adelaide Brown was born around 1854 in Kansas City, Missouri, to high society parents herself. In fact, the town of Brownsville, Nebraska, was named after her father. In 1872, she married a man named Welcome Bodkin, great name. After their marriage, the couple had a son named Beverly and moved to Stockton, California, where Welcome took a job as a grain broker. Cordelia was immediately not a fan of Stockton and moved to San Francisco to set out on her own. As you can imagine, Cordelia was a character, to say the least. She was not conventionally attractive, according to media outlets at the time, but always dressed to the nines. She loved fashion, photos, and generally attention of all kinds. At one point, she bragged about being photographed in over a 100 poses, her favorite of which being a pose with her hands behind her head and elbows out. Think a Victorian version of Matthew Broderick in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. She was controversial in a lot of ways for the time, many controversies beginning around her independence, her selfishness, her outspoken nature, and her flair for the dramatic. Cordelia Bodkin was truly up for anything, which was put to the test when the then 41-year-old Cordelia encountered John Preston Dunning, who was at the time 31 and taking a casual bike ride through Golden Gate Park. At this point, Dunning had been having a lot of sex outside of his marriage and had been fired from his fancy AP job that he had moved his family to San Francisco for, after embezzling thousands of dollars to pay some outstanding gambling debts. But back to Cordelia Bodkin. Nearly a decade younger, John was immediately smitten with Cordelia, who was apparently just sitting on a bench. John stopped dead in his tracks, needing to talk to her. And they did. John told Cordelia that he had a wife— but she was so uptight and too religious that she didn't understand him. He complained that Elizabeth tried to make him live by moral standards that were, quote, too high for me. 
Cordelia responded with her own reinterpretation of the truth. She told Dunning that she was Cordelia Curtis, a helpless 29-year-old with an estranged husband in London. Some accounts say she told him her husband was dead. You can be the judge. The two immediately began what would be a three-year-long relationship, which was mostly comprised of partying, gambling at the racetrack, going to the theater, and having sex. At this point, Elizabeth, John's wife, had had enough. With the divorce still not being a viable option, she took her young daughter and moved back in with her parents in Dover, Delaware. With Elizabeth across the country, Cordelia moved to 927 Geary Street in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco, and John took a room in the same building. The two spent most of their time together until the Spanish-American War broke out in the spring of 1898. On March 8, 1898, salvaging his career seemed more attractive than staying in San Francisco and continuing on with his mistress, so Dunning accepted a position as a war correspondent with the Associated Press. This position was in Puerto Rico. When he broke the news to Cordelia, she was not happy. She pled with John to stay, but he refused, saying he had to leave for his assignment immediately. At first, he wrote regularly to Cordelia, but eventually the letters stopped coming as frequently. John also told her that he would not be coming back to San Francisco after his job. In fact, he planned on returning to Dover to give his marriage to Elizabeth one last try. Cordelia again was not happy with any of this information, and the two stopped talking, and that was kind of that. Or was it? Soon, anonymous letters began arriving at the Pennington house, informing Elizabeth about her husband's betrayals. Elizabeth's father intercepted and kept a lot of the letters, sparing his daughter the stress and embarrassment. Three months go by and John is in Puerto Rico, Cordelia in San Francisco, and Elizabeth still with her daughter Mary back in Dover, living with her parents, her 44-year-old sister Ida Harriet Dean, Harriet's husband Joshua Dean, and Ida's two kids. On August 9, 1898, the Penningtons were eating a light, summery dinner of fried trout and corn fritters with some friends. That's a great gross detail that every source mentions. After dinner, Elizabeth's 14-year-old nephew Harry went to get the mail at the post office, returning with a wrapped box labeled bonbons, addressed to Mrs. John P. Dunning and postmarked from San Francisco. There was no specific return address. Inside the note read, quote, With love to yourself and the baby. Signed, Mrs. C. Elizabeth assumed they were from Mrs. Corbelly, a friend she had made during her time in San Francisco. So the party retired to the veranda, and Elizabeth, with her ever-notorious sweet tooth, dug in, eating three pieces herself and sharing the rest of the candy with her sister Harriet and four other dinner guests. Shortly after, Elizabeth, Harriet, and some of the Pennington dinner guests began to become violently ill with stomach pain, hot flashes, and intense vomiting. The next morning, Elizabeth Dunning died. Her sister Ida died three days later. The family's doctor initially thought Elizabeth and Ida's death could be blamed on a bad batch of corn fritters, but as a seasoned criminal attorney, John B. Pennington didn't buy it. He sent samples of the chocolates to his friend Theodore R. Worf, the state chemist and professor at what would become the University of Delaware. Worf was shocked, finding copious amounts of arsenic in the samples. Autopsies later showed that both women had ingested enough arsenic to have, quote, killed a horse. Not a very scientific way of putting it, but, you know, effective. Bernard J. McVeigh, an investigator assigned to the case, looked to chocolate shopping pros for how to chase leads. These different shipping and manufacturing companies pointed McVeigh to Haas and Sons Confectionery in San Francisco, where they said the box was undoubtedly from. Meanwhile, John Pennington matched the handwriting of the cruel anonymous letters sent to his daughter and the handwriting on the note of the chocolate box, both strikingly similar. Prize of a husband, John Dunning, finally made his way back to Dover as soon as he received a telegraph about his estranged wife's death. When presented with the package and the letters, he admitted that he thought his longtime mistress, Cordelia Bodkin, was responsible. Of course, John had told Cordelia all about Elizabeth, her likes, chocolate, friends, fidelity, her dislikes, mistresses, her friends, her life, everything about her. Armed with this knowledge and the pain of their breakup, John knew that Cordelia could be dangerous. Detective McVeigh was sent to San Francisco with the evidence, passing it along to San Francisco Chief of Police I.W. Lees. Cordelia was, at that point, living back in Stockton with husband Welcome and son Beverly, 
and was immediately brought back to San Francisco for questioning. In San Francisco, Cordelia was positively identified by two women, Miss Sylvia Haney and Miss Kitty Dittmer, as the woman who bought a box of chocolate candy in the candy store of George Haas on July 31st. They remembered Cordelia requesting that the candy be placed in a fancy box, which did not have the firm's name on it, and also instructed that the box not be filled completely as she had another thing to put inside. John Dunning also submitted love letters from Cordelia into evidence, which were examined by handwriting expert Theodore Kaita, who testified that the person who wrote the love letters also wrote the address on the candy box and the note. Frank Gray, a druggist at a local drugstore, positively identified Cordelia as the woman who had purchased two ounces of arsenic for bleaching a straw hat and insisted on buying arsenic, even when Gray informed her that there were better ways to bleach a hat. Then, a postal clerk named John Dunnigan came forward, saying that on August 4th, the day the chocolates were mailed at the ferry post office, he assisted a woman mailing a package to Mrs. John Dunning, a name he remembered because it was so similar to his own. A woman named Almira Ruoff came forward telling investigators that she had a conversation with Cordelia in Stockton on July 27th, 1898, where Cordelia asked how different poisons worked on the human body and asked if it was necessary to sign your own name when sending a registered package through the mail. Of course, more and more evidence was mounting against Cordelia Bodkin, obviously, and the state of Delaware began preparing extradition papers to take Cordelia out east for a trial, find her guilty, and put the whole case behind them. But as you'd imagine, it didn't quite go as planned. Let's take a break. Hi. The hit series Claim to Fame is back on ABC. From executive producers of Love is Blind and hosted by superstar brothers Kevin and Franklin Jonas, watch and play along as these new celebrity relatives do whatever it takes to keep their famous family a secret. Don't miss Claim to Fame, new Mondays at 8, 7 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Are you the type of person who seeks out the things lurking in the shadows? Do you thrive off of the fear, the mystery, and the unknowns of the world? Then you're in the right place. Something Scary isn't afraid of the dark, and we know you aren't either. Hello, I'm Blair Bathory, writer, director, horror lover, and host of the Something Scary podcast. Fear is a universal language. The things that scare us connect us. Every episode of Something Scary is filled with ghost stories, urban legends, and shocking accounts of paranormal activity sent in from our listeners around the world. Something Scary is also something special. We've been raising the voices of women in horror for over 200 episodes. Don't miss a single moment of spine-tingling fun. Subscribe to the Something Scary podcast wherever you're listening. New episodes are released every Tuesday. Sweet screams. Hello, how are you? Hello. How are you doing? Hello. You good? good? You good? You good? You up? Mm. You don't have to be up. You know. In fact, just cruise through this. Yeah. Napping. Yeah. That's okay. Take a quick Mm. nap. Sure. Nap to this. Rebecca's been doing it. (laughs) You can tell. (laughs) If you saw my face right now, you'd be like, check. Mm -hmm. We want to say hello to anyone who's listening, supporting, spreading the good word of Ghost Town. Thank Thank you you so much. Thank you. We appreciate. Mm -hmm. We also... Thank our lucky stars for our government. (laughs) All day. We always do. They're here for us, and they ask nothing. They just live to serve, and we live to celebrate. It's a a tough job, but they do it so well. We want to say hello to the mayors. Of course. In the house. Hello. This mayor is like a big old bag... Of one of my favorite candies, Swedish Fish. Wow. Love Swedish Fish. Classic. That's a classic choice. And I somehow knew you were going candies with this one. How? We'll never know. Casey Weber. Hello. Oh, you want to get fancy now? I do. What what about those candies that I don't know how you describe them, but they're like round balls of chocolate (laughs) with like a gold wrapping Rocher? Ferro Rochers? Ferro Rochers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those I can't are even good. say it. Those They're so good. fancy. They're so fucking fancy. That's Charlie Gilbert. Hello. And how about not in season candy corn, which I love. <laughs> I, I also love candy corn. I love it, and I'm here to yeah. celebrate it. And you know what? You know who rocks it proud? Cat Joselle. Hello. 
Huge fan of candy corn. And possibly my favorite candy. Ooh. Nature's candy. Fruit. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I don't even know what. Say Necco wafers. No. I don't know what even fruit looks like. Ugh, gross. I'm going to say the whole Haribo. Is that, is that, is that yeah, Haribo? 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 Yeah, they're good, whatever they're, they're called. They're yeah, very love fucking it. good. So many favorites. Oh, love them all. So good. High quality gummy. Twin snakes. Mm-mm. The star pack with everything. Oh, that's a good one, yeah. Fuck yeah. That would be Ashley Matson. Hello. And our governor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She's the Willy Wonka. Ah. Oh. And... People are happy to fall into a chocolate well to their uh, demise. <laughs> yeah, g- gladly they'll they'll take a little teacup daffodil. They'll take a bite. They'll be rolled up in a blueberry. They'll be shot through chocolate pipes. It doesn't matter. Float up into the air of fruit spray. I forget that scene. Do whatever you want. Be a TV. Go through a TV. But when it comes to that glass elevator. It's all her baby. Yeah. She's not giving it to anybody. Mm, nor she takes she. it to a private no. candy jet. Because those kids will fucking fuck it up. As they all do. But they're our future. <laughs> anyway, that would be <laughs> Avian Noble. Noble. If you want no ads, no chit chat, bonus episodes, just the good stuff. Seven days free. You can listen to some bonus episodes or some ad free ones and then bail or support us a little bit extra. Mm-hmm. Up to you. Check it out. People have been doing it. They I don't do. know if they're sticking around or not. Doesn't matter. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't want to look. It's just like, hey, who? How many people have broken up with you? I like to pretend that we're all still dating. Yeah. Keep those doors open. Head on over to patreon.com slash ghost town pod. Wanna get back to it? Let's do it. Let's do it. At this point, the state of Delaware wants to try Cordelia Bodkin. She is obviously a criminal. But with the help of her new attorney, George Knight, Cordelia's legal team was successful in petitioning for the trial to be in California. This decision was upheld by the Supreme Court, and the Dunning family and several other witnesses were legally obligated to schlep across the country and spend weeks living out of a hotel to give their testimonies. Keep in mind, this is all in the height of William Randolph Hearst's sensationalism, his newspaper empire. The media, of course, had a field day with all of this. And Hearst got richer than ever over the chocolate candy murders, Bodkin's over-the-top personality, the scandal, the strange details, everything. The San Francisco Chronicle published sketches and photographs of Bodkin nearly every day. Uh, One of the photos had a comment that said, quote, They indicate plainly the woman's excessive vanity and her fondness for posing. Totally unbiased, level-headed journalism, of course. To give you a sense of how crazy and popular this story was, when word broke that the chocolates came from Haas Confectionery, so many journalists swarmed the place that staff members had to go into hiding. The trial of Cordelia Bodkin began on December 9th in front of Judge Carol Cook, and the country was watching. Crowds descended upon the courthouse every morning, hoping to snag a coveted seat in the courthouse pews. One rainy day, whole clouds of steam formed in the courtroom from the dampened clothing of attendees. The place was so packed with damp onlookers, media, and trial enthusiasts. On December 9th, John Dunning himself testified. At this point, not a haughty journalist, but an old man with a, quote, whiny voice and thinning hair. Sources note that he refused to mention the names of other women that he had been intimate with. When he wouldn't cooperate with this fact, he was found guilty of contempt and sent to jail, where he remained for several days until the question was officially withdrawn. On the day of closing arguments, more than 500 people were turned away from the courtroom for lack of seating. But those outside also had their own kind of show. The San Francisco Examiner set up a giant bulletin board outside of the court, where they posted snippet summaries of what was going on inside. Oddly enough, with all of this going on, Cordelia Botkin's parents had no idea that their daughter was one of the most famous people of the moment, failing to put together trial headlines with the name of their daughter. The Daily Press of Sheboygan, Wisconsin, strangely reported, quote, there was a little paper in the village where Mrs. Bodkin's older father and mother lived, and the paper printed everyday accounts of the trial when it was going on. But they called it the Dunning case, referred to Mrs. Bodkin always as the accused, and the old man and the old woman read the paper and talked about the famous murder case over together and never even dreamed that, quote, the accused was their own daughter. And all the little village took hold of hands and formed around the old people a cordon of silence, and woe to anyone who dared to try to break through. 
We are prone to think of heaven as a place far removed from anything we know here on this earth. But oh, that little village out there, nestling in the green, green hills of smiling California. I wonder if the angels do not look down upon it and smile. Very weird reporting. On December 30th, 1898, Cordelia Bodkin was found guilty of murder, and on February 4th, 1899, she was sentenced to life imprisonment. On March 9th, 1899, Welcome Bodkin sued Cordelia for a divorce on the grounds that she had been convicted of a felony. But the circus was far from over. Cordelia's legal team petitioned for a new trial and got it, which necessitated another huge migration of Delaware witnesses back to San Francisco to relive the whole thing again. The second trial also resulted in a verdict of guilty, and on August 2nd, 1904, Cordelia was again sentenced to life imprisonment, which was again petitioned and upheld by the state Supreme Court on October 29th, 1908. After that, she was sent to Branch County Jail, pending the decision from an appeal to the Supreme Court. Pending the decision of an appeal from the Supreme Court. About this time, Judge Cook's wife had passed away, Judge Cook presiding over the first trial, and every Sunday he'd visit her grave, riding out to the graveyard in a streetcar that directly passed Branch County Jail, where Cordelia was incarcerated. But one Sunday, he was shocked to literally see Cordelia Bodkin on his streetcar with a man. She signaled to the car to stop at the county jail, and the two left the train. The next day, Judge Cook instituted an investigation, where it was discovered that Cordelia was trading sexual favors for a very comfortable life in jail. She was allowed to dress in all of her glamorous clothing. She could go outside the prison building and visit the facility's gardens whenever she wanted, took her meals in a private dining room, and made lots of field trips back into San Francisco. The county sheriff claimed that these field trips were supervised, with a guard always nearby, and he wasn't wrong, but Cordelia's supervision was pretty much just dates with some of her favorite guards. This happened so frequently that two prison guards had actually gotten into a fistfight over Cordelia. One guard had threatened to expose the fact that the other, whose name was Frank McFarland, was having an affair, and McFarland instigated a violent fight, beating the other man nearly to death. Media reports claim that McFarland walked away from that fight completely calm, whistling his favorite ragtime tune. And the guy Judge Cook had seen Bodkin with? He was another lover on a date with Cordelia. Smitten with Cordelia, the man had attended every day of her trial, gotten in touch with her in jail, and arranged a romantic rendezvous outside of the prison. At this point, the media called Cordelia Bodkin accurately, in my opinion, quote, the siren of the Branch County Jail. When charged with manipulating, let's say, her prison experience, Cordelia defended herself by saying the person that Judge Cook saw was probably someone that looked like her, so much like her that the mystery woman was probably the person who purchased the arsenic and candy. But nobody bought it. And after an earthquake and a fire destroyed most of the Branch County Jail, on May 16, 1906, Cordelia was transferred to San Quentin State Prison. At this point, things go downhill for Cordelia Botkin. Her ex-husband, Welcome, and son tragically pass away, not very long from one another, and Cordelia sank into a deep depression. In February 1910, she applied for parole because of her health, but it was denied. I think, at this point, that Cordelia realized there would be no more appeals, no more forgiving rules or situations. Even the media turned against her, even more than they maybe already had. The Evening Times newspaper of Alameda, California said, of the woman in her final years, Quote, whatever beauty she may have possessed has long since departed. Pretty harsh. In 1908, John Dunning, whose journalism career had now been permanently ended by the notoriety of his lover's trial and who was struggling with alcoholism, died in Philadelphia. On March 7, 1910, a 56-year-old Cordelia Bodkin herself became unconscious and died. The death certificate shows that she died from, quote, softening of the brain due to melancholy. A Delaware journalist in the 1950s named Joe Martin observed that Cordelia Bodkin and her whole case single-handedly invented a new means of homicide, murder by mail, which was not quite true, but almost. In 1891, a doctor in Rhode Island named Thomas Thatcher Graves sent some arsenic-laced whiskey to a rich heiress who had made him a beneficiary in her will. This fact would make Cordelia Bodkin the second ever murderer by mail but first in the pairing of a male-bound murder weapon with a truly unforgettable, tragic, and salacious story of love and infatuation gone very, very wrong. (laughs) 
Did you know that Disney World was originally meant to be a Bioshock-style libertarian utopia, and that Walt Disney lobbied the Florida government to allow them to have their own creepy independent government, which they still have to this day? <gasps> or how about the fact that 90 school supply company Lisa Frank was run by violent, tyrannical drug addicts who abused their employees? <gasps> Well, did you know that there's a Japanese guy who killed and ate a woman in the 1970s but due to a legal loophole was never put in prison and became a weird Japanese celebrity who wrote food reviews for magazines? Well, actually, we did know all those things because we made episodes about all of them and many more on our podcast, Deep Cuts. Deep Cuts is a deep dive explainer show that explores fascinating but true stories that you won't believe you've never heard about with deeply researched, sometimes shocking, sometimes hilarious episodes. The show is like a really juicy documentary for your ears mixed with Mystery Science Theater 3000. Deep Cuts has new episodes every single Wednesday for free. Just pause the podcast you're currently listening to and go subscribe to Deep Cuts anywhere you get your podcasts. Hello, everyone. What is up? It's Savannah Brimer here from the true crime podcast, Killer Instinct. If you have a true crime obsession like me, Killer Instinct is the podcast for you. Join me every week as we dive into the wildest, most twisted true crime cases. Anything and everything from unsolved, solved, cold cases, missing persons cases, and serial killer cases. Each case will leave your head spinning. So make sure you pause what you're listening to right now, head over and subscribe. That way you never miss an episode. We post every Wednesday and I can't wait to see you there. Hi, did I scare you? I hope I did. My name is Selena Spooky Boo, and you might know me from some places as of TikTok, where I do some sleepwalking and dad joke videos, but what you don't know is that Selena Spooky Boo has a podcast, The Haunted Estate, that's been around for uh, an embarrassing long time, but I'm gonna tell you right now, it's full of the scary stuff, the spooky stuff, the hard stuff, and hey, some of the funny stuff. So come on over and hang out with us and check out The Haunted Estate. <laughs> 